Kado. It is an absolute pleasure to be back here in Brighton today with you all here. In 2017, I was really lucky enough to get a ticket to attend. If you look into this photo, way back there in the middle, I'm, I'm hiding over there, waving along, as you were all this morning, to, to the photo from 2022. Um, I work as a software engineer, I'm currently a health tech a startup in London, working that works with the NHS. Before that, I was working at the BBC on the BBC News website. Um, there's a bit of a theme here, you might tell, kind of like public sector, kind of tech for good, that kind of thing. That's something that really interests me, web accessibility, how we can use technology to make the world a better place. So, today, um, I'll be talking to you all about digital exclusion in healthcare, what it means, who it affects, and how we can change it. So to start, let's begin with a story, going back in time for a bit. Not quite far as back as 2017, uh, but to the summer of 2020. I, perhaps quite like a lot of folks in tech, was working from home. Uh, we were out of one lockdown and into another, had a break in between, all of that. I didn't see very many people, and so most of the photos from my photo reel are from the flowers and trees on my midday walk down the street. Um, I was quite lucky um, that I, had, I was able to work from home. Um, and it's quite seamless for me because I had my laptop. Here's my setup, like my laptop on a stand, a keyboard, um, everything on my dinner table. Um, and basically, instead of what I was usually working from home one day a week, and that became full time, and I was basically constantly at home. Um, hands up, who, who had a similar experience? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot, almost about half. <laughs> Brilliant. So, yeah. Um, I was doing some things to distract myself. Um, so I hadn't learnt to crochet, that'll be my next, hopefully it doesn't need to take a pandemic for me to learn that, <laughs> but I feel really inspired to try that. I was doing some crafting things. Um, all of my socials with friends and family had moved online into Zoom. Uh, here's me and some family uh, attending a wedding online. Um, and who'd have thought it? Um, and during that, uh, I was helping family like set up things. It's like, what is Zoom, how to download it, all of these types of things. Okay, uh, being tech support. Now, in a room full of lots of people here, who, how many of you had to be technical to support somebody, one of your loved ones? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Amazing, yes. You, you can really get to know what the user experience of something is, right, when trying to explain exactly what sequence of buttons and things someone should click. And when they say, why, I'm like, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Right. In addition to all of this, all of um, concerts and conferences, which previously you had had to um, travel to a specific venue, um, and like consider travel, accommodation, all those things, um, some of them went online. And so for many people, they didn't have to um, do all of these things, and they could still attend. So there were um, theatre shows that you'd need to be on, like in Broadway in New York, but you could enter, you could see them in London or anywhere else if you had an internet connection. And for friends who had chronic illnesses and disabilities, a whole world of experience that had opened up that previously were locked away from them. Alongside all of this, as so all of this was happening. Uh, I was listening to the news and I was checking the NHS website quite often, to be honest. Um, I checked, uh, checking any time someone said that the vaccinations would be ready for my age group, I'd be like refreshing and seeing when I could sign up. Um, and then in uh, summer 2021, uh, I booked it in for my vaccination. So I went onto the website. I um, didn't need to phone my GP, wait in the queue, say on hold, none of that was needed. Um, I just booked myself in, got a text message, and knew where to go. Really simple. And I wasn't alone in this. Over the course of uh, that time, uh, 20 million adults in the UK booked vaccinations online, and that's about 61 million vaccinations. For the vast majority of people, it was their first time using an online tool for healthcare reasons. And that's not all they were doing. It wasn't just vaccinations that people um, were using digital means. Um, video consultations had moved digital as well. So what is a video consultation, right? Um, so instead of a patient physically needing to go to their GP surgery, 
or a hospital and have a face-to-face -face conversation with a doctor, a nurse, a therapist, physio, um, you'd have that online using online tools. Here's a mock-off of um, uh, how an actual tool that was used um, is set up with like healthcare professional on one side and a patient on the other. Patients booked in for the session and they usually like receive a text on their phone with a link and it takes them to a page where they can use the camera and microphone on their device and they could have that conversation. This technology has been around for a while. Um, it's, it's not brand new, it didn't kind of spontaneously <laughs> be created in 2021. Um, but the need, the, like the needs, as you're probably all aware, of like social distancing, um, not having lots of groups of people sitting in waiting rooms, um, meant, meant the uptake of this technology shot up hugely. And actually, um, people working in surgeries, working in hospitals, were actively seeking out. They were talking to to their providers, digital providers, to be like, "How can we get technology here immediately? Because we need to serve um, our patients." Here's actually a quote from a patient who had a child who needed to see a specialist at a hospital. She said uh, she didn't need to take the morning off work, pay for travel, have the inconvenience of waiting in a waiting room for an hour, not sure when an appointment will happen, being delayed, in order to have a 15-minute appointment. Uh, she could have um, that appointment in convenience of her own home. So there are so many benefits to using technology for these tools. Um, so many people like me, um, booking my vaccination, like this patient here, who benefited hugely um, from the move to using websites and web technologies to address healthcare needs. However, not every, I was thinking, cool, that's benefited me and a whole bunch of other people, that's great. Um, but who's actually missing out? Who isn't able to enjoy using these tools and make the most of them? Some people have patchy internet. Um, photo of, photo of a, um, a rural um, location um, up in Scotland. Some places are like this place, where if they were trying to uh, book in their vaccination, they might get flaky internet. They wouldn't necessarily receive the text message immediately. Might be wondering, oh, is this going to work? Is, has it actually gone through? Has it not? Do I need to call my surgery? What's happening? Um, yeah, so they don't necessarily have that reliability of having uh, fast internet and, c and consistent internet. And this isn't just rural places either. There are like um, blocks and hotspots even in large cities and towns and, and other places that, that just don't have connectivity at all. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in the country who access digital services using assistive technologies. Uh, this is a photo of a woman um, using a laptop with, um, also with a braille display. Um, there are lots of different technologies there are. So you might have heard of screen readers and, and other types of tools that, that people use, and those are fantastic means in order to access um, digital content and communicate with other folks and consume content, healthcare content as well. However, not every website is set up in a way that has, as we've talked about before, uh, a semantic HTML um, that is using um, you know, the best practices in order for folks with assistive technologies to make the most of them. So this is a barrier. This can be a barrier. So that's another group of people that may be excluded. There are thousands of people who don't have fixed postal addresses. Um, I'm based in London, and if you walk down pretty much any major street, especially in central London, you'll see a lot of people who are homeless and who may not have a fixed postal address. Uh, this is a photo of a, um, a traveller community in England, and um, um, generally, if you're um, unaware, uh, Roma traveller communities, they um, have a nomadic way of life, and they might, they, there's a whole part of their culture is so to not have a fixed address somewhere, but to, but to um, yeah, to, to move around and, and things like that. And what was interesting is, is that some folks, actually, there's a barrier for them to receiving healthcare. And, so, so um, there's a report in 2019 by a community called gypsytraveler.org 
that carried out a blind, uh, blind testing with um, calling up GP practices across the country and uh, asking, basically saying that they were a patient and they'd like to register for, um, to be a patient in that practice. 48% uh, of GP practices contacted uh, wrongfully refused to register that person. Um, it's a legal right in order for everybody to, be, to have access, um, but they either had the wrong information or the system that they are using required them to have a postcode and, uh, and, and that kind of information, and so they're like, oh, I can't do anything. And so those are people who, I mean, this was a study, but that represents a lot of people who are trying to access healthcare that were otherwise um, being prevented. Did you know that one in every five people in the UK are in poverty? Now, if you listen to the news, especially lately, you hear about the cost of living crisis, with bills increasing at a far, far higher rate than incomes. Many families, not just the poorest, um, will need to decide between like, food and heating costs and whether to get the uh, shiny new uh, internet data package um, or even smartphone device. So digital exclusion, exclusion is all of these things. It's from, as you said, as you just said, not having a device in the first place, or having one but not being able to afford the internet package in order to use it effectively. It's having, um, maybe it's like that you have um, had those tools, right? Uh, but the barriers is that the app or the website doesn't support the way you need to interact with it. Digital exclusion is also the systems and processes that you have not being flexible enough to allow for your, your current way of life. And it's also not having the infrastructure around you to support you. In behavioral science, there's this model called the Combi model. And this is something that we can use to try to make sense of all of this. There's so many different aspects of this that we've talked about. How do you kind of like categorize it and try and understand it so that we can try and address some of this? And so it's the COMBI, so an acronym there, um, which talks about capabilities, opportunities, and motivation as the three key factors for capable of changing behavior. And then in this case, behavior, we're talking about like um, addressing, accessing, um, accessing the healthcare and things. So, for example, capability is a person's ability to participate in actual activity. So, for example, they're able to search for an app online or download it and install it. That's a capability. Opportunity is about like, external factors um, that make behavior possible. So that's like um, having access to a device, having access to the internet, things like that. And lastly, motivation which I thought was really interesting because I hadn't really considered it before. Um, these are the thoughts that are conscious or unconscious thoughts that really inspire that behavior to like access healthcare. So for example, as we were talking about before, um, groups of people who historically uh, marginalized and not able to access um, healthcare in the standard way via a GP or something like that, um, they might be reticent to try it over and over again. To, to when they keep getting rebuffed, and that may impact their motivation. And then that, in turn, may impact how they behave um, in, in relation to um, healthcare in, in general. So yeah, so actually thinking about this, it's, it's like a person's experience doesn't just fit neatly into a category either. There's like an overlap, and so some groups of people can be ex um, having experiences related to all of these. Okay, so that's a lot of things, right? What can we do to change things? How can we like pull apart all of these barriers that we've talked about and figure out how to make change happen? What principles should we think about um, and what tangible difference can those in this room um, have? Not just, not just something about in the future, maybe at some point, but like in the current day, like today, this week. these are principles that I think are really important to think about in general, relate, especially related to this. And it's to be research-led. Um, 
So, and when I say research-led, um, also to be user-centered in that research. So carry out research, be user-centered. So those are terms. Um, I've, I've been working in tech for a few years, and I hear these kind of terms thrown around a lot. I'm not sure if you hear them not a lot. And in a lot of cases, they're just like things that like sound like shiny, like jargony words, right? Um, but I particularly want to emphasize being user-centered rather than product-centered. Because I don't know about you, but when we, uh, in a lot of cases, when you talk about research and, and you work in a team that's making, making websites or apps, we're thinking about research. How well does my app do with, this, with, with a group of people? How does this web page um, you know, um, have an, 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 an impact on the person? And we're not actually thinking about what the user, or in this case, a patient, real experiences. We're not really focused on their lives and what they need. We're really focused on our products and, and like validation for the things that we're doing. So yeah, so I think this is a particularly important thing to, to, to think about, to really be focused on the user, or in this case, patients. And talking about it being holistic. So not just considering the 10 minutes that they're going to spend on your website trying to book an appointment or something like that, or, or um, trying to get a video call set up, but think, how does that fit into their day, their lifestyle? Um, talked about earlier how um, some folks don't have fixed addresses. In a lot of cases, that means they won't be able to um, register for a local library. That means they won't be able to access free computers and internet, um, and all sorts of things like that. And so, even, so somebody might be like, oh, they can, they can get access if they really try. Well, yeah, well, would you like to have your private doctor's conversation in a local library <laughs> when you've got lots of people listening in? I'm sure I wouldn't. So let's now go through some aspects where we can take some of the research that's already been carried out by other people and uh, find out what they've learned and figure out how we can um, apply that to our uh, everyday. So starting out with simplify. What can, do, what can we do to simplify things? So 15% of adults in England have English literacy levels uh, at the age of 11, uh, 9 to 11 years old. So that's called entry levels, one to three. I was quite surprised at that. Um, one thing that you might have noticed is, is that healthcare content has a whole bunch of jargon and, and acronyms. And, and if, you've ever, if you've ever actually um, asked for a printout of a conversation that your GP's had with like a consultant in the hospital, it can be kind of terrifying. Because you have all these contents of like something, something is calcified and all of that, and you're like, oh my god, am I going to get arthritis? Like, what is this? And apparently it's just that you broke your toe a few years ago, and there's something there. And it's like, OK, cool. Lots of jargon. Terrifying, right? Um, but yeah, so what can we do about that? Um, we can use pain language. Um, those of you who are in, in libraries, uh, a lot as a kid, like I was, might uh, find this uh, icon, um, this uh, stamp familiar. It's on the back of a bunch of books and textbooks and things like that. So this is a um, logo uh, by the Plain English campaign. And if, if like a pamphlet or a book or something is, it's like meets the standards, you could apply to have it approved. You can even have a website approved. I remember seeing some of these ages ago on, on like HTML websites at the bottom of those. And um, what that means is that we're using plain language. And we talked about plain language being important for, like, you know, it could be 15%, probably more of the population. Uh, but also, it will be helpful for folks with learning disabilities, simplifying the language. How about the many people where English is an additional language? They run it on top of the other languages they know already. But they're using idioms and like phrases and, 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 and casual language and interspersed with acronyms and jargon and all of this type of thing. It's quite overwhelming, so we can use plain language. Well, what does that really mean, plain language? Uh, here's an example that's on the um, Plain English website. Specifically, there's a section on the medical information, which is quite interesting. And it's some, some of the... <laughs> Quite straightforward things, you'd think. So it's taking something from using passive voice 
and using general terms like general categories like patients and talking and changing that to the active voice and talking you directly, you are the patient and simplifying some terms. So before, an information helpline is also operated by ABC Hospital Trust for the convenience of patients. And changing that to, we also run an information helpline for your convenience. How do you feel <laughs> hearing one versus the other? Hopefully the idea is, is that it's talking to you in a really helpful way, as though somebody is explaining something to you directly and not that you're kind of reading a man user manual somewhere. Health literacy is your ability to understand and make decisions about your health. And so if we make our, uh, the language that we use um, plainer and simpler, it's not just going to affect a few people, it's going to impact all of our understanding and our ability to have better health literacy and understand what's going on with our own bodies and our own health and be able to make decisions that can impact us in a positive way. So four in 10 adults struggle with um, consuming health content. And that's actually, it's over six in 10 um, struggle with content that includes stats. And, I can, and that's like, stats not just like numbers like this, but also like tables and graphs and like the comparison of things like that. So, um, you know, so, so your doctor might give you a EMI chart. That might be quite confusing for somebody trying to figure out how, what they're supposed to do with that. And there's lots more complicated things as well. Um, we can really improve every single person's health literacy by taking these steps in order to simplify our setup, simplify our processes, and improve them. When you decide, when you design with the most marginalised people at the centre, you improve the experience for everybody. Let's go on to some other ways that we can do things. So there is a website uh, with the NHS Content Style Guide. It's a brilliant site. Um, it's, it's got topics in terms of like how to talk to patients, how to do that in the written form, and also to clinicians, things like that. And to be honest, if you're not doing anything related to healthcare, I still highly recommend having a look because it's got great principles that like any written format of anything would be, would, would be helpful for. And um, my favorite thing, actually linking up from this page, um, is this story, my favorite anecdote. Um, so here, um, they did some research in terms of how, um, how patients react to the terms that they get sent. So like, so let's say we talked about like calcification of loans, but things like, oh, you need your, to, make a t to give a stool sample ready for your appointment at the hospital. And whether people actually understood what that meant, whether there were questions, <laughs> actually, uh, they made like a decision overall across the board to change, um, change the word and decide um, against using the words uh, we and stool and said pee and poop because that worked best. So, hey. In addition to the language that we talked about, you can simplify uh, technical complexity. And cool, we're in a room of people who care about tech and work in tech in various different ways or have an interest of in, in, in interacting with tech. And so here, technical doesn't necessarily mean what, 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 what you or I might call technical uh, in terms of like, you know, needing to spin up a server or build a website or things like that. It's, it's how you interact with technology as well. So I don't know about you, but... The way, when I kind of encounter a new website, I like to click on everything. I'm like, I like going to the menu, figure out what's on there, and like going to the footer, and like uh, click a toggle and see what that button does, and all that kind of thing. Um, but there's lots of research that's been carried out that, that shows that there's a, quite a large uh, percentage of the population that's pretty much terrified of doing that. They're terrified of breaking things. They're terrified that, especially if it's related to healthcare, they're like, if they do the wrong thing, then that might lead to like, their GP not getting a message or um, something going wrong and their consultation being put back. And it, it creates a lot of anxiety for some people as well. And, um, and so we're talking about um, simplifying technical complexity, talking about 
They're all like simple everyday things. So reducing the number of interactions that you need to get to full content. So this is an example that is like, I've recreated, it's not exactly how I've seen it, but it's pretty much similar to this, where there's this bit of text which looks like a link, so I was like, I know I'm gonna click it. Does it take me to the web page? What does it do? Um, and actually, it, um, it had this little uh, tooltip which gave the address. And I was like, why? Why do this? <laughs> um, and like looking at the rest of the page in context, it could kind of tell that they wanted to like simplify the page layout and make like it was in a wider card, and they wanted to like make it and like make it align with the buttons and all of that, and make it look pretty and, and like lean so it looked like a mobile fair. But you're adding complexity there. It doesn't need to be there. <laughs> could just have it below or, or things like that. You don't need to hide things in accordions all the time that need somebody to like tap ten things to get to the end and, and see the content. Make things simple. Reduce that technical complexity, if I can say that word. Um, have a single action per page. That's another principle that's, that's talked about in the content style guides and probably a lot of like um, gov.uk websites and, and, and public sector um, services as well. Is have a single action per page here. Um, if you use the booking system online for your vaccination, you've probably got to this page quite a lot. Uh, what is your NHS number? One clear action, one field to fill in, and one action to submit that and continue to the next page. You don't have a whole form of like, okay, what appointment do you want and what this and all this is all on the same page, no. You've got one action, it's really clear, and then you can move on to the next stage. No distractions at all. So another aspect that we can think about a principle is to give users choice. I just talked about taking away choice in some way, give users choice, what's happening here? Um, and it's about not forcing users to interact in a certain way. So, equality is giving everyone the same web form to book their appointment in and saying that's it. That's all you're gonna use, no other options. Um, in this, um, diagram is there's lots of different versions of similar ones online that you may have seen. Um, there's equalities on uh, the left, and it's everyone's given the same tool to use. And some people uh, face different barriers and fewer barriers, and they can use that just fine. And other people have more barriers and um, to that, and that tool isn't just doesn't cut it. And so equity is actually um, either changing that tool in order to make it more useful to the folks who need it or replacing that with another one that is, does, a, does a job better. So yes, yeah, so it's giving users the choice that work for them can lead to them having an equity in their experience. So what, what could that mean uh, with regards to like digital access and healthcare and things? So one thing that I recently found out was that in, in the NHS, whenever they're deciding to um, award contracts to technology providers, so let's say uh, a company that uh, have, enables video calls or something like that, because that's not all done in-house in the NHS, they uh, contract that out in a lot of cases. Um, then that NHS trust often, um, or body, um, rates the services of organizations and like compares them against a set number of criteria. And one quite important aspect that those companies offer um, is, um, sorry, one important aspect which those companies are like rated on is um, their approach to digital inclusion. So and do they have an alternative to the web form, uh, like a phone line, so that people who have questions about the, uh, filling in their appointment booking um, can really talk to somebody and have those, those fears like assuage and like, have those questions that they have answered. Um, I know that last time I wanted some more information on like a website, it went, there's usually like a web chat in the corner and you click on it and it's like the worst thing ever <laughs> because it's like, it kind of be, can be kind of flaky or sometimes there's a bot that makes it sound like it's a human, it's got a human face on it. And you're typing and I was like, you're not a human. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, and you type it in, in some more, and it kind of says, can you repeat that, please? 
and you try something else, and you can you repeat that, please? And I was like, you try something. I was like, can you just like get me to a human, or just say that you don't know, or just give me the full list? Like any of those options will do. Um, and that's like I'm, I'm quite familiar with this. This can be quite frustrating for somebody who who's does, doesn't know how to like hack around the algorithm of a um, of a, um, a web chat on a on a website. That can like that kind of experience related to healthcare could like put somebody off from accessing, like trying to get an appointment entirely, and like that can impact their own healthcare outcomes. So it's not just a tiny little widget on a website; it can really have monumental impact. And this is a a, a quote from um, a healthcare professional when they were talking about how they're using um, healthcare and digital healthcare. Um, through the pandemic and after. Well, still through. Whole discussion there. <laughs> um, but moving into the future was digital first should not mean digital only. So allow those traditional methods and approaches to li live alongside the cutting edge ones. So let's talk about another aspect here. Learning about lived experiences learning about all of your lived experiences, patients' experiences. Research, research, research. Uh, I can't state how useful this is. It can be a fantastic way to understand barriers that people are facing. Um, and it's important to not just like focus on like the, that bulk of folks, like the 90, 80 percent, the people who are really vocal. People, when you if you send out an email to your users and they reply and they say, yeah, yeah, I'm really eager, because they're probably the person, people who will uh, vocally complain if there's an issue or like really um, be proactive and engaged. No, you need to actually go out and go out and go, like get somebody or you or somebody else to go out into the community to find the people who are not interacting with your services at all. Work with community groups and people on the ground who, who work with people who don't have fixed personal addresses, who don't have uh, fixed addresses, who um, don't have internet access reliably in their homes, who are using assistive tech, and bring those people into like this, um, this kind of a research lab. This might be really intimidating. People don't have time. People might have lots of jobs. So you need to change the way you do your research. Go to where they live. So this is a photo from my um, previous job uh, when I was at BBC News and we did some accessibility user research into how um, people are navigating a new website and whether like the headings and, and buttons and links and, and like sections all made sense. And it's fascinating. So some people were like local to London and were really happy to come into this lab and some um, there was actually the user research went to people's homes in order um, to actually experience uh, how they were interacting with things. So you know, we had people that use switch devices, which is an assistive tech, in order to, um, uh, to access content on websites. And, um, and that is their comfort zone, and that's how, in their own home, using their own, um, their own tools. And that's, that's how we got a lot of more information about uh, what their barriers were in order to using our website in that case. But it's also relevant for anything, really whether it's a website or an app or, or anything else. So yeah, can't, uh, can't underestimate how important research is. And then once you've done that, um, it's to take that qualitative data that you have, that quite rich data from folks who are experiencing quite a lot of barriers, and bring those into your everyday processes. So um, what does that look like? So it can be um, figuring out that, oh, that particular device, that encountered issues when, when going through tabs and through our page, or, or um, our pages, this, this page is really, really slow to load. You need to figure out why. Um, let us replicate that in our office using um, some test devices not using our shiny mobiles that are the latest thing, but actually using the things that actual users, actual patients are using. And uh, we were talking about um, how to make our world greener and things, and making things lighter, and making web pages performant, using like HTML, CSS, all of these types of things. Um, all of these have a real impact on 
real people. And so this kind of loop of doing some research and then also implementing, um, like testing regularly in-house at home, you, it can be even at home, you could probably find a really, really old mobile on eBay for not that, not, not that much and try, try using that. Tethering that to your phone, see what a flaky, a flaky connection could look like, all sorts of things like that. Um, yeah, highly recommend it. Here's a, another aspect that we can talk about, um, building trust. I think this is a, quite an interesting one because it's about building relationship. I think Lawrence earlier said about um, how you can't design something if, you're not, if you don't have a relationship with that community or the group. And, and yes, it's that building that trust. And how can you do that? Um, it's that communication. It's, it's, it's that it, this will take time. Um, you, by definition, if you're creating something, you have a relationship with the person that uses it. You might not know them. They might not know you. But there is a relationship there. There's a relationship there. It might be transactional. It might be through, because it might be transactional, because it might be a corporate website where they're just buying something. It might be one of enjoyment and joy, like a personal website that has fun games and things like that. All sorts of things there. Uh, but there is a relationship there. And I think it's fascinating to think about, and particularly in the realms of healthcare and health tech, how we can build trust and really um, go to folks and communities and, and say that, you know, we are listening and that we actually care about your experiences. You might not know how to address them right now, and that's fine. But being open and honest about that really, really um, can lead to trust. So, we talked about things that we could do, plain language and all of these types of things, building trust. What about all of these other systemic barriers to, to digital inclusion? We talked about things like poverty and all of these things that seem like so huge, right? What can I do about that? Well, um, there are organizations that are already trying to do things already. So um, the Good Things Foundation has done a lot of research into digital ex exclusion and as a result set up um, some two really great services. One is a national device bank making uh, devices, so like mobiles, tablets, laptops, available to those who need them most. And they find um, these, uh, who needs the most, how do you find that? So they actually partner with local community grassroots groups who really are embedded in communities. And they also partner with uh, folks who have lots of devices. So maybe if your company has a lot of phones and laptops and things like that that they don't need, or that they're you know, upgrading to the latest shiny new Macs, and you've got a whole bunch of other things, um, give them a shout. You can, you can donate them. Um, OK, cool. They'll be like, OK, someone uh, says so somebody who is um, who's contacted by that community partner, is identified as like they need, they need a device to access their healthcare or important services, um, and they're given one. But what use is that if they don't have a reliable connection or to internet and things like that? Um, there is the National Data Bank, also set up by the Good Things Foundation, which provides um, free internet data, like minutes, uh, texts, to 500,000 people nationally. <coughs> And they're working with telecoms organizations in order to provide that. So yeah, so there are lots of these organizations and, and this is just like one example. And yeah, so one way to um, impact them, this is actually a charity. Um, so they rely on donations and, and volunteers and things like that uh, in order to function. And then you might think, cool, so there's charities, that's great, right? They're, they're doing the things that we need them to do. They do a lot. But why do we need to rely on charitable donations in order to get this stuff happening? It doesn't really have to be that way. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there's, uh, there's a lot of capital somewhere hidden in the UK. We might, some people might not be, might be finding, uh, finding it difficult to get access to a lot of it right now, but there is. You know, we're probably fifth or sixth the richest country in the world. Um, that means a lot, right? And there are, um, 
Yeah, and there are a lot of things that, um, that can be done here. There are several campaign groups and research bodies that are working in tandem with like, grassroots organizations in order to change the status quo. As you may know, the access to shelter, to education are considered universal human rights. And here in this country, we have a national health service, right? And it's something that um, I and I know a lot of people I know are proud of. So I think that's, it's, it's fair to say, you know, healthcare here is considered a human right as well. And that everyone deserves access to it, no matter what their means are, their backgrounds are, or barriers there are in society. And then now that we're using technology and the internet and digital means in order to further that, the, the reach of healthcare, the, the impact that healthcare can have, the, the, access, the improvements that they have, surely the internet therefore becomes, um, yeah, access to the internet becomes a human right as well. So yeah, there's a lot here. There's a lot can be done. There are lots of actual organizations that, that, that are actively impacting and are working in this space. One thing that I found really interesting was the conversation. So I work, as I mentioned earlier, I work in a health, health tech organization that was uh, really ha um, was focusing in, in the pandemic to support NHS, um, NHS services and enable people to book vaccinations. And one of the things that I found out after the fact was that um, during the pandemic, I'm not sure if I should be saying this or not, but I've heard it, so whatever. <laughs> during the pandemic, there were some discussions about, um, about how you know, the booking system was online and things like that, and whether it would be possible to, um, to zero rate um, healthcare like texts that you'd get or receive, and like zero rate um, internet related like searches and things related to healthcare and you know video calls that you're having with your doctors and consultants in like whether it's a GP or a hospital and things like this and, and that was really interesting to me um, because what happened is that that's, that process was taking time right but there were three people like telecoms organizations like government government policy makers like tech companies all kind of having discussions about this because there was like lots of pressure there was like this whole impact of like we need to we need to improve things for people um but nothing quite came of that there but that makes the, that, that leaves the door open right what that makes it possible for that to happen that makes it possible a possible thing in the future So, so it's about breaking barriers to digital inclusion. Talked about a whole bunch of different things that you can do, whether it's in your everyday, you know, carrying out research, simplifying things, language technologies, choices leading to greater equity, learning lived experiences, building trust, supporting grassroots um, organizations that are doing real good there and influencing policy too. So, breaking barriers to digital inclusion. It's all in your hands. Thank you. <laughs>